Let's open the meeting of the Moffitt Roxbury Board of School Directors at 631, um, January 3rd, 2024. Um, before the meeting starts, I do want to say that Emma, unfortunately, is stepping down. Uh, we're going to miss her very much. Uh, and then thank you for all your great work. And they're going to be with us through February 7th. Uh, but I do want to put word out that um, basically with the timing of the uh, that will be up for election uh, on town meeting day. So if any member of the public is interested, please get in touch with Libby, Mia, or me, and we can help guide you on that. But uh, you will need to get on the ballot, and that will require getting 30 signatures from your community members. And I'm not quite sure of the deadline, but in the past, it's been right around the end of January. So um, if you're interested, let us know. Uh, there's not a ton of signatures, but um, you will need to, to get on. And I think given the timing, we will probably not seek to appoint someone and just have, have the public take care of it because we're really... That's, uh, is that our final meeting before town meeting day or we have one? One, more. one more yeah we have one more um yeah so uh that process is out there again uh get in touch with uh libby me or me all of our emails are on uh the website um and we look forward to having me or emma for the next three meetings right and while we're on that subject yes it looks like mia you're up jake you're up uh scott is up and Kristen is up for re-election those seats. are making decisions yes. right 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 yeah. so anybody who would be interested in those needs to get that paperwork in by the end of january exactly for, it's like the last monday in january yeah it's, yeah it's in some number of days before town meeting day but i think it's like the five mondays before town meeting day or something like that yeah yeah so that's kind of soon so, so uh, kind of soon yeah and in montpelier john odom the city clerk can help you out with all that yeah and i think there's i think there's a form on the website that you can mm -hmm. print out in fact i know there is because i've used it um yeah no and uh you can have friends family members help help you with with signatures um and people can sign multiple documents um Petitions, so, petitions yeah, to put yes. somebody on the ballot. Um, I just want to put it out there too that I'm personally willing to help people if you're collecting signatures. I'm very good at collecting signatures. So if mm. somebody's interested in running, email me and I will walk around my neighborhood. <laughs> I, I think I got 30 in like an hour one time. Here I'm on. Which is what you need. I think it's 30. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is 30. Um, and I also suggest getting maybe a few more than that just in case. You know, someone signed it who's no longer on the voting roll. Who, yeah. you know, it has to be able to read it or it doesn't count. So it has, it has to be what legible. Yeah, yeah. So a few extra just to make sure is always yeah. get forty. Get forty signatures. Yeah. Yeah. And if anybody from Rockbury is listening or is interested, the contact is Tammy Legacy, who's our yeah. town clerk. And we're hoping you're one of the interested, Kristen. <laughs> she's just nodding but yes okay good, good. We, we, we like nods um uh so first call to order public comment we're gonna have two public comments again uh, as part of the budget process uh this initial one and then we're gonna have one after our uh third draft of fiscal year 2025 budget presentation uh so you're welcome to speak at both, uh, but just for, for people who want to speak, um, you will have two opportunities. Uh, and I just want to reiterate that, you know, public comment is a, is a listening time for the board. Uh, we uh, do not respond in real time. It, however, it's, it's obviously a very important part of our decision-making process. Uh, we do listen very carefully. Uh, we do take into account everything we hear. Uh, and I also just want to acknowledge that um, you know it can oftentimes uh, be somewhat difficult to speak in front of a a, a board like this, um, both because it's public speaking, which not everyone is comfortable with, and also some of the some of the issues bring people bring to our attention can be be difficult. So we really appreciate the feedback. Uh, you can also 
uh, email the board at school board at MPV, mpsvt.org. Um, and that is another great way to, to send us your thoughts. Um, and, and also in a, a slightly less um, real time public manner. Uh, so do I have anyone who would like to speak a public comment? Let's start in the room. Um, any hands? Uh, and let's go to the Zoom. Uh, if anyone would like to speak, uh, there's a raise hand function. It's if you, uh, the reactions bu button. If you hover over it, a little raise hand comes up. Um, otherwise, if, if you um, don't know where that is, you can just go on camera and give us a wave. Uh, looks like at this time, no. So again, we'll have public comment after the budget presentation. Uh, next order of business is the consent agenda. Uh, the consent agenda um, are items that generally require no real board discussion uh, or deep consideration, things like approval of the minutes, et cetera. Uh, and that helps us do business a little more efficiently. And if there is something that a board member wants to discuss in more depth, they can pull it off of the consent agenda item uh, as part of a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Do I have a second? A second. Any discussion or questions? All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Great. Um, Christina and Libby, take it away. Mm -hmm. Oops. And, and again, before you start, I just want to thank you for all the fantastic work you've done over the past couple months on these budget presentations. Uh, I know it's been a, a tough year and a lot of numbers to crunch. And uh, we really appreciate the the very, very hard work you've done uh, explaining this to us all and getting us to a point where we can uh, process it and make a decision in a couple of weeks. Sorry, well, the numbers- Is this the class for raging alcohol? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Right. Raging alcohol today. Our first Zoom moment. <laughs> That's what it was. Um, okay, so here's our third draft. We do have, just let me set it up for the whole thing. We do have um, the, the lengthy budget presentation that was presented a few board meetings ago with our um, strategic plans and links to links to all their documents and websites and all that kind of stuff, which I think we'll just glaze through today. Yes, sound good? Um, because we've gone through that at length at a separate time and it hasn't changed at all. Um, so we can get to the budget stuff. Uh -huh. So here's just some district information and demographics. Our context still is that we want to support our theory of growth while being sensitive to the ta tax implications of our community. And the statewide factors, as we've been talking about, we have Act 127, which is a new pupil waiting, and it has a variety of implications on our budget. The anticipated dollar yield is $9,452, and keeping in mind that that is voted on by the legislature in May, so that is that will remain anticipated for the entire budget season. Uh, the common level appraisal has come in, because I think it's changed on there, so the common level appraisal has come in, so the board will see new numbers for the CLA. Um, in this budget, our health rates have increased 16.4% across the state. That's not just an MRPS thing. That's a that's a uh, statewide factor. But for MRPS, that equates to almost $400,000 increase to our budget. Um, and then local factors is or we do have decreasing student enrollment. The district drivers, just the board's focus is academic achievement for all students, safety, inclusion, and belonging for every member of our community a commitment to open communication with the community. This is where I'm going to kind of glaze through it because the board has seen this before. They they haven't changed from previous uh, presentations that we've done. Here's all of the big pieces um, for staffing, professional development, and leadership for each of our four tiers with links to work definitions, um, curriculum sites, assessment sites uh, that are now public on our website. Um, after a whole lot of good work from our central office team. 
and the budget. Uh, here's our glossary of terms. So it's nearly impossible to talk about the budget without using some of these terms, and many of them are very confusing and hard to understand. Um, even for myself, my six year six year as superintendent, it's still kind of hard for me to explain what the dollar yield actually <laughs> is. Um, so, if you're if you're caught up on terms, kind of pull this out of the packet or keep this bookmarked for yourself so that you have these uh, this lingo. The big ones that affect our budget are our general fund or education spending. That's what we are in control of as a district is our education spending, most of it. The long-term weighted average daily membership is what used to be the equalized pupils. It's now in Act 127, that big long-term that we will just refer to as LTW or we'll probably refer it back to weighted pupils. Um, the dollar yield, is trying to make make everything equal a dollar um, and generate enough money for the ed fund. So the the rule of thumb is that when the education fund is really flush and we're in a really good good economy, that's a higher yield. That means lower tax rates. And if the the con economy is not as good or the education fund is lower and not quite as flush, that means a lower yield and higher tax rates. Um, and this is set by law. We do not have any control over this. And then, of course, the common level of appraisal or CLA, and it's the your market value of your house compared to what the appraised value is for the property. Um, we want it as close to 100% as possible or over. Um, and if once it starts dipping below that, then our taxes start to increase. I do okay on those terms, Christina. <laughs> Uh, budget unknowns at this point in time, we still don't have a final long-term weighted ADM or equalized pupils. We've gotten three different versions in the last two, di four different versions in the last two days. Oh. Two of them came yesterday, <laughs> an, an hour apart from each other. So um, we're, I think we, we think we have a final number, but we're not, nobody's sure. Because <laughs> that's a number that the Agency of Education comes to us. We actually do know the CLA at this point that that should be taken out as the budget unknowns. Um, our transportation aid, we're still waiting on and we're in contract negotiations with one no, of our students asked me. All right, Christina, take it away. Okay. You all have seen the budget at a glance. I'm gonna go over this real quick. Um, the first column is the FY24 final budget after the yield was set and CLA was adjusted for reappraisal. Um, so that was what folks paid taxes on this current year. Um, you can see the calculation of each line to the, uh, to the far left. You'll see that we're adding the general budget to the capital plan equals the total budget. So you can follow down throughout the column. The next green section is um, FY24 budget if Act 127 were in place. So this is what we're comparing to for the FY25 budget. And this is our third draft. Um, the expense, the general budget has not changed at all. Neither has the capital plan from previous versions. Um, so our total budget is 32 million and our net tax revenue. So these are, um, other revenues like tuition and interest and grants and that sort of thing. So you can reduce your total budget by those revenues. So your ed spending is 26 million. And this is an updated pupil count. Okay, raise your hand if you really give a shit about that. Go ahead, yeah. Christina. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> meeting. Yeah. Um, all right, so our pupil count went up as of, I don't know, three o'clock yesterday, uh, 1,835.93. So that's giving us our ed spending per long-term weighted average daily membership of 14,549. And currently the property dollar yield is set at 9,452. And because we're capped at 5%, the tax, the residential tax rate will be a dollar thirty-three. These CLAs um, changed. Montpelier went. We were. Well, that sucks, doesn't it? So, Montpelier CLA, we were using a hundred percent and went up one hundred point eighteen percent, and Roxbury has decreased to ninety-four point five one.
I think you're up for the next few slides, Libby. Uh, here are our enrollment projections for MHS, MSMS, and UES. Okay. Um, it does show, if you look way down at the bottom, K through 12, uh, that we are decreasing. We're modeled to continue to decrease, but it's a gradual decrease. It's not a precipitous decrease. These are class size estimates uh, for the MHS, MSMS, and UES. Um, so where we are right now is we have four, where we have five teachers at the grade four level, and we are suggesting a uh, reduction in force in our case. Shut the hell up. level for teachers. Um, the, the numbers to the right for 24-25 and 25-26 are shaded in yellow simply because we're watching closely our class sizes at Union Elementary School um, as potential reductions later on. And then here are our enrollment projections for Roxbury. The difference between projections from the Montpelier schools and Roxbury, particularly at the elementary school, uh, Union School, is that um, there's a person who does modeling based on childbirth rates in Montpelier. That doesn't that type of modeling doesn't happen in Roxbury, probably because of the population size. So there's no scientific rhyme or reason to where these numbers are going, except for the class goes down to the next level the next year. Here's just our graphs. The board sees this type of graph every every year. So you can see kind of historical trends from our population or our enrollment, sorry. So this is what the the this particular budget has as an overview. We've had to add in 2.55 interventionists. That was primarily due to the loss of ESSER funding, which was federal grant funding over the last few years from COVID. Uh, we are adding an Ro Roxbury after school program 1.5 FTE. This is, this is an add to our budget, but we're hoping to offset it with revenue. Currently, this these positions are funded by a grant that will not be available to us next year. Social worker um, has been being has been uh, being paid for through Medicaid fund balance, but because we've done a good job of paying down that fund balance through this work through this the paying the social worker. Um, we need to move this now into our local budget. And there's a new payroll tax for the child care tax. That's 0.44%. Um, that's going to be added. The district will be paying that. That's added onto every employee's um, paycheck, and the district is paying that. In terms of reduction of force, we're suggesting an AFSCME support staff position of 1.0 FTE. A K-6 licensure, 1.0 FTE for low enrollment. Uh, RVS Pre-K, 0.5 FTE for low enrollment. The RVS Library Media, the technology piece of that job, which is 0.2 FTE. And an MHS Science District wide sustainability, which is 0.2 FTE. As far as the expenses by school, I mentioned this before in the first time that we went through this longer budget presentation, but I think it's important to say again, um, as far as the union cost increasing, there's, we believe that in future years, there's room to uh, come more in line with our class size policy. At Union, we have very low class sizes right now or will have low class size in the next few years at Union. So there's room to bring that cost down because of our class sizes, which we're, we'll be getting to around 12 and 13 in the class and our, it's way below our class size policy. Um, there is not as much wiggle room at Roxbury. So that that number won't be doing anything but going up in the future um, because we just we can't we can't reduce any force in Roxbury after the really after the point two for the technology position. Every other person is needed. And then you wanna you wanna do the highlights for the expenses and the revenues, Christina? Um, we have two different ways you can look at our expenses. And this is by program. So looking at general education, special education, things like library, school board. Um, so e there's a common theme on the increases here, which is health insurance and where we landed with negotiations. 
So there, and the added positions that Libby mentioned earlier. Um, nothing has changed since the last two board meetings. Um, so we're looking at an 11.9% increase in our expenses. The next two slides are just looking at it um, a little differently. So you can see the percentages of your total budget and where they end up. And the next slide is a year to year comparison. You can see a big jump in special education. We were, we were expecting that, so we planned for that. Expenses by category, this is where you can see the breakout on salaries and benefits, um, professional services and contracted services. Um, there hasn't been any, this again will show the 11.9% increase in our overall expenses. And on the pie chart, yep, you'll see how it's broken out there with salaries and benefits. And the next slide, you'll be able to see where the benefits really kind of spike up from last from this current year. Uh, revenues. Again, nothing's changed on the revenue side since I've met with you last. Um, we did. Uh, compare our special education expenses to the revenues, the offsetting revenues that we'll be receiving. And most of these at the bottom, those are all um, matching the grant expenses. So those are all reimbursable grants. So whatever we spend, we get dollar for dollar back. So that's like IDEA, Title I, Title II. Mm -hmm. This just demonstrates your revenues. The capital plan, um, I met with Andrew and he put together what we should be focusing on for the capital plan in FY25. So he'd like to look at the US window replacements and the Main Street window replacements and also some roof repairs district-wide. Mainly here at the high school. I'm sorry? Mainly here at the high school. Over yeah, the over the cafeteria. <laughs> And what everybody wants to know is the tax rates. <laughs> this was an earlier slide, but I'll go back through it. Um, so this draft, I'm gonna focus on the gray area, the gray column. So this draft of the budget is an increase of 11.9%. The long-term weighted average daily membership is calculated at 1,835.93. So, that did increase from the last time I met with you. They're still working out um, ELL students. They found us some students in our data that we had submitted quite a while ago. So that was good. Um, that decreases our ed spending per pupil. I'm gonna keep that short. <laughs> and again, um, you'll see the capped rate is $1.33. And the updated CLAs get Montpelier tax rate to $1.33 and Roxbury $1.41. The next slide will demonstrate if you own a $200,000 house in Montpelier, what you can anticipate your tax bill to be. Um, it's going to be an increase from this current year of $430. For a $300,000 house, it's going to be an increase of $645. And for a $400,000 house, it'll be an increase of $860. In Roxbury, same house values will be $221, $331, and $441. The next slide demonstrates um, the tax rate history from FY21. So you can see it with the CLA and before the CLA. The next slide is the non-residential tax rate calculation. So our budget does not affect this tax rate, um, just the CLA does. And this is um, on properties like uh, second homes, uh, rental properties, commercial properties, and that. So we have been playing around with five-year with assumptions. As this was something the board asked to Try to play with a little bit more. So we we did three different assumptions, um, and I just want to really reiterate the word assumption 
none of this is true. <laughs> so we need to just keep that in mind. Um, some of it are good guesses and others are just, let's see what would happen if this happened. Um, so just keeping this in mind that these are assumptions for the five-year trajectory of 127 with the 5% cap in place in the law. So just to remind people that 127 starts this year, is effective this year, and there's a 5% cap um, on equalized tax rates. That's your tax rate prior to CLA being calculated in. Um, and so that's a that's a given number. We know what that's going to be um, for the next five years. We don't know what it will be with the CLA because the CLA changes, um, but we know what the equalized tax rate will be for the next five years because it's capped as long as we reach that 5% threshold. Um, what we what we don't know is what will happen in FY30. So we were asked to make some assumptions to take a guess as to what would happen to tax rates um, in FY30 with certain trajectories. So assumption one, we made the assumption that our general budget would increase or our education spending would increase by two million a year. Um, we made the assumption that we would lose fifteen. Um, long-term weighted ADM per year, which is a proc, that's actually a, probably a pretty good guess, but who really knows? Um, but that's a, that's why that one is kind of solid for each of these assumptions, because it's, it's a reasonable guess. We're assuming that the dollar yield will fall $500 per year. Um, so that puts our potential with those assumptions in place. It puts our potential equalized tax rate increase before the CLA is calculated from year FY29 to FY30 as at $3.01, which would be a 47% increase in one year with these assumptions. If we were to put that in with the CLA, and we can assume based on past averages that the CLA could drop approximately 3% per year um, because we're not up for reappraisal. So it's it will continue to either stay the same or drop um, most likely then that has the tax rate when we're going from FY29 to FY30 at $3.54, which is a 55% increase with these assumptions in place. What? In five years, yeah. Well, from 29 to 30, that's one year. <laughs> so, go ahead, Jake. Um, is this starting from a dollar? Yeah. 33? Yeah. So you'd see on the next slide, the projections, how it's going to increase. So the, the green is the cap rate. Okay, so the percent increase is just in, the, in that final yeah. year? Yeah, just 170. Year. It looked like it was oh, okay. 170 in FY29 you had on there. Yeah, yeah so to, the final... four, to 470. On assumption, nope, sorry, no. that's assumption two. So, $3 dollars and one cent. Yep. On assumption one. Yeah. So that's where the percentage difference comes in. Uh, assumption two, still going with a $2 million increase in our general budget, still losing 15 long-term weighted average daily membership per year, which is per pupil. Um, but then we played with the dollar yield a little bit. Um, and this is significant because you can see how much the dollar yield could impact things. And this is a number we do not have control over. Um, so if over the next course, five years, the dollar yield decreases by a thousand each year, which is a lot, um, that's a lot. <laughs> that would not be good if that happened for anybody in the state. Um, then the potential equalized tax rate increase pre-CLA from year, fiscal year 29 to fiscal year 30 would be $4.70, or we'd go up to $4.70, which would be a 56% increase. And the potential tax rate after the CLA would be $5.53, which would be a potential 70% increase. With assumption three, that's, that's, significant. that's just showing you how much the dollar yield in and of itself influences tax rates, um, which of course is set by the legislature just based on the, the economy and the money in the ed education fund. Assumption three, um, we got we made the assumption of getting right to the 
um, under the 10% for long-term weighted average daily membership, which is where we need to be. So we don't have a tax review from the magical tax review committee at the Agency of Education. Um, assuming a $500,000 increase per year, uh, losing 15 long-term weighted ADMs, the dollar yield falling $500 a year, then the potential equalized tax rate increase pre-CLA from FY29 to FY30 would be 32%. So our tax rate would go up to 2.40. And after CLA, it would be $2.82, which is a 43% increase. So these assumptions you can see on a line graph. Starting from FY24, FY25, the green line again is our capped amount. So that's the this is the equalized tax rates. It's not before CLA, it's the equalized tax rates. Or I'm sorry, it is before CLA. Sorry. That is our capped amount. So the capped amount in FY29 will be a dollar 70. That's what it will be if we can stay capped. Um, and so you can see that the assumption one is a $3.01 and goes up to $3.01 in FY30 with assumption two. It goes, and that's the one where the dollar yields so low, it goes up to a $4.70 equalized tax rate. And with assumption three, which is a less increase, less decrease of the dollar yield and less increase to our budget, it's a $2.40 tax rate. And just keeping in mind that these are assumptions, this is not reality. Nobody can paint what this is. Actually, this is, these are just assumptions for, to show a potential five-year impact and why the administration has been talking about the necessity of bringing down our general budget because that is what we have control over. We don't wanna to have to do that in one year. So we're up for discussion. Um, and just a reminder, the upcoming meetings, next, the next board meeting will need to be um, an approval of a budget from the board. And um, March 5th is the budget informational meeting on town meeting day. Quick question. Is the presentation you just gave, is it in the materials on the website? I'm sure it will be as soon as Anna puts it on there. Okay. <laughs> I think it would be helpful because we have so many folks watching from home if they could have the chance to basically thumb yeah. through it like the folks in the room can. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> if she hasn't already, she may have done it this afternoon. Yeah, and we have a whole section on the website with budget information. Yeah. Um, uh, Questions, discussion, comments? Jake? Um, I think that this is really valuable. Um, and I'm pointing at the line graph right now. The colorful the that... line graph. Um, it's hard to do, you know, hard to know what's going to happen. But um, I, think, I think this is like a really valiant best, best guess. Um, they are but, guesses. And yes. that's, that's the important thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> they are guesses. But yeah, I think it's I think it's great work. So thank you. Yeah, no, just want to reiterate that they they are guesses, and I think they also, you know, show the predicament we're in, and that you know being being cautious uh, is is prudent. Um, Rhett and then Kristen. Yeah. Um, it's the, um, I, I want to confirm whether my understanding is correct. Um, when we talk about the cost per pupil at each school on page 20 of the presentation, and then we look at the, um, like the budget at a glance one, the difference is this number is based on our actual number of kids and right. the budget at a glance is based on the long-term weighted ad average daily membership or in the past. You are correct, yes. Okay. Actual kids in seats. Yeah. I just. I know, I yeah, know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Numbers. I know. Yeah. Kristen. I just have a question about the um, guesses uh, chart. In terms of the 
potential res residential tax rate. So that's calculated for Montpelier based on a 3% CLA drop. Do we know those, did we calculate those for Roxbury and what that would look like? I didn't do that with Roxbury. So I just did it with Montpelier's. Okay. So is why I assume a CLA drop of 3%, is that just again, sort of like a guess or is that kind of an average? It's looking back at kind of what has happened over the last few years. So it's a guess, but it's based, I went back into budgets and looked. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't do Roxbury's because Roxbury's isn't as typical. How so? Sometimes your CL, the Roxbury CLA stays the same. Sometimes it drops. Sometimes it's a surprise. Like it, it's not as typical as like uh, the Montpelier CLA. Uh -huh. And I'm not sure why, but... but because uh, CLA is, is is basically done via an appraisal that happens every 10 years, correct? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> Jake's shaking his head. No. No. Six years. The, the CLA changes every year. Yeah. Um and it's, oh. it's your it's like how your the fair market value of property in the town has changed since your last reappraisal. So every year it's moving a little bit yeah. different. But the reappraisal process for the town ten years. Six, six to ten years. And then that gets us yeah, maybe to hundred percent, right? Hopefully. Yeah. 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 For so a year the CLA, there's been less kind of variation over the time yeah. throughout the years at, at Roxbury. So yeah. there's less inclination to look at that. <clears throat> okay. Other questions or comments? Jill has a question. Oh, Jill. Oh, sorry. Oh, good. I can unmute. No, I was just going to articulate um, the CLA for towns that have so much fewer parcels that change hands every year, like Roxbury is much more volatile. It's literally just a numbers. This is sorry. This is my day job. So when you have a really small town, you might have, you know, 100 property sales per year. That means that the change year over year is pretty big or, you know, can be pretty volatile, whereas um, I think, I don't know exactly how many parcels there are in Montpelier, but it's a larger pool of sales to choose from. So it it can be pretty consistent that the CLA changes year over year. That's all. Thank you, Jill. Hello. Um, I wanna <clears throat> reiterate the thanks that uh, Jake gave um, to Libby and, and also to Mia that they spent quite a bit of time over their winter vacation um, crunching these numbers. And I do think it's it's really valuable and it's helpful for me to understand what's likely sort of the cliff that we keep referring to, what's likely to happen. And so this these numbers have really helped me understand that. Um, it doesn't make me feel any better <laughs> um, about what, you know, it just, it makes me feel like our community has a lot of work to do to, um, you know, lobby our legislators to change what this cliff looks like because it feels uh, not plausible that people can afford these types of increases uh, in the year 2030. It's enough to know that we're facing 5% increases every year, but then to look at the numbers in 2030 um, and then I started thinking about 2031 and 2032 and, you know, getting, getting away from myself. But, um, so I did have a point of clarification. It was about the percent increase, um, in the assumptions. So listed on this slide, what page? um, I don't have page numbers on this. Oh, 35, I think. Um, so so, for example, the assumption to the potential residential tax rate for Montpelier increase is five dollars and fifty three cents. That's listed as a seventy percent increase from what number? From a dollar seventy. And so so five dollars and fifty three cents is a seventy percent increase to a dollar seventy. Well, uh, but it was four. Is the dollar seventy? But the dollar seventy is pre CLA, and this is after CLA. Oh, yeah. Does right. that Thank matter? You. Thank you. Yes. I Sorry. I think Thank there's you. there's something funny there. Um, it's a dollar seventy the year before, 
pre-CLA. Right. And then it goes to 470 pre-CLA. So that right. would be a massive percent increase, not 40 something. Right. It seems like more like a 300 oh, yeah. percent. My, my math could be off on those percentages. Christina didn't check me. <laughs> and, <laughs> She's like, I know it. I can see it. Like, you should have let well, me the check reason I should should have out. Check this. Sorry about that. The reason why I stood out is because like Mia had helped me sort of with some looking at more of the raw data and and in that raw data, that number, the tax rate impact in 2030 can potentially be like a 300% increase to our, the actual tax money that I pay out as a taxpayer, homeowner in Montpelier. And that's a really shocking number. Yeah. Like, I mean, 70% is shocking enough. Yeah. But I think, 100% is... I think putting the percentages aside, and I apologize if I made the math mistake, it's totally mine and I didn't have my business manager check it, okay. um, is that regardless, any of those assumptions, the tax in, the tax impact in FY30 is is large, <laughs> right? Even if, we, even if we're very conservative over the next five years, the tax impact is going to be large if nothing else happens. And so that's what... That's what we all need to work on for the next five years. Like that's what we're trying to get across by saying this isn't a one-year dilemma or challenge to the school board in the district. It's a five-year challenge to the school board in the yeah. district. And I think it's worth pointing out that it's probably going to be sizable, even if the legislature does do something, because I think a fix likely to come from the legislature is probably one that's gonna push that trajectory downward. It's not probably going to put us on where we can. It, it, we will not be returning to historical yeah. tax rates. It's my hunch. Yeah. Right. But just, you know, that was a very sobering moment to look at those numbers and see, like, I, you know, I've been sort of feeling like, okay, well, we can all sort of band together and do our best, but a 300% increase is sort of like, feels insurmountable for this board to, over the next five years, to sort of whittle away you know, hundreds of thousands at a time to a 300%. Yeah, and increase. keeping in mind, that's with the dollar yield dropping a thousand a year, mm -hmm. right? Like that's considered, that's bonkers <laughs> to put a professional word to it. Like, I don't know if that would actually happen, right? but it's an exercise in showing how much the dollar yield impacts the tax yeah. rate with that. And we don't, we don't have any influence on the dollar yield. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's more, showing that than anything else. I Jake would probably be able to say, or, or Jill better than I, but I think a thousand dollar decrease per year for the next five years in the dollar yield would be a very sorry state for the for yeah. the yeah. state of Vermont in education. I mean, we know we have some time, some years ahead of us to sort of plan and be ready for this, but I think that um, it, it feels like something that actually needs to, like it doesn't seem realistic for the taxpayers to shoulder that burden. And so it does feel like something needs to change. And I just think, you know, I don't want to be alarmist, but I do think the community needs to um, start paying attention to the legislature and what's happening around these changes. And that that was sort of my takeaway from these assumptions. Um, I did have another question. Can I keep going? Yeah, or? Go for it. <laughs> um, so I, I kind of I just want to return to a sentiment that um, Scott brought up at the last meeting, um, which I keep coming back to and agree with, is just like getting a little bit closer to that ten percent in this first year while we're still wrapping our brains around what's going to look like. Is there any chance of sort of you know I mean the biggest thing that keeps coming up as a question is that point two position. But is there any way to sort of level out the cuts a little bit differently and not be at an eight point? I think we're at 8.48 .8 and maybe get closer to like 9.4. Is the there any? The only thing I would respond with is the more you add this year, the more you'll have to take it out eventually. Mm -hmm. if, we're going to have to find places to take it out eventually. Yeah. If the law doesn't change and if things don't change dramatically. Right, which I think they need to. <laughs> no, and I completely agree with that, Emma. But I mean, if, if, even if the legislature steps in and says, says stabilizes the yield so it stays mm -hmm. relatively constant and doesn't drop, we're still like kind of on a 
a path of, of cutting, we're still probably at a place where not to have a major spike in taxes at mm -hmm. 2930, we're going to have to care. We're going to have to be restrictive in, in what we spend on. I mean, I, I think the legislature could make a lot of changes and it would take some of these like draconian things off the table, but it would still, it wouldn't put us in. We can go up to 10 because we, we because it's year one. I mean, I, I think, you know, as, as Libby was saying, the, we're, we're going to have to, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to make these choices in year one or in year three or in year four or year five. Jake's got some questions. I think another, another possibility at the state level um, is that the legislature takes another look at the 5% cap and might actually increase it, which is not a good thing. So like oh, instead of five, 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 five for the next five years, you know, it could be five, seven and a half, 10, 12 and a half, something like that, mm -hmm. which would be punitive to us. It would be bad. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a possibility. Um, as far as budget development, I think Mia's idea from a couple of weeks ago um, makes a lot of sense, if I understood it correctly, um, is yeah. it, you of, of our reserve amount or um, surplus or whatever it's called, I can't remember. Fund balance. Called, fund balance. Um, you would want to, we might potentially want to use as little of that as possible to get up near the 10%. Um, and so that we have it to later on. To use it later. Because yeah. right now we're planning on taking two, 165? 165 more than we had originally budgeted for. Is that yeah. right? 565? Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That would most definitely be one strategy that we should probably consider um, over the next five years so that we can have that FY30 and beyond, you know, thinking about how we can continue to help taxpayers using that fund. I would I would be supportive of that. Yeah, I would yeah. be too. And and any other places that we can look to sort of ease the burden on people, especially community resources. Mary? I would want, I would like us to talk about the point to RIF from sustainability. I obviously I'm not comfortable with any of these cuts. I'd be concerned if any of us were. It's not like fun. Um, but I just don't see how that specific event makes sense. Um, I understand that cuts and letting go of employees in any way is going to be painful, but it doesn't feel like a logical or strategic cut to cut point to when we know that we're going to lose the employee. Um, so I want to ask that we look for other sources for RIFs if we need to, or cuts, or at least that we discuss it. I'm always skeptical when I hear this is just how it has to be. I know it's going to be painful either way. But I just feel like it would be really Scott. Yeah, I appreciate that sentiment, and and I I agree. Um, you, Libby, you 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 say that you're gonna have to make those cuts eventually, but that is in itself an assumption you are making. Um, and so I I just want to be careful. We we have the most information about this budget that we're building and we have less and less information about going further out and so um i just the, the confidence level in in projections out into the future is lower and so uh, yeah i just i i have to agree with with what was just um articulated and um i really like what jake brought back up and I think Mia you were originally the person to, to say it and I, I wish I had said this at the time but but if I remember correctly that like changing the fund changing what we withdraw from the fund balance is really just a trick of 
um, of accounting because if we don't spend it, it just goes back into the fund balance, right? And so there's no downside to, to saying that we're gonna increase what we're withdrawing to get up to that 10%. But if we don't ever use it, then it all goes back into the fund and we have it for future years. And so I just don't see any reason not to, um, to use that mechanism to get the, um, the increase year over year closer to nine and a half or so. Um, I think, again, I think we're, we're leaving money on the table by, by um, only going to what I don't, I don't have it in front of me right now, but would you say it was 8.46 or 8.64? So. 8.48. 48. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I definitely understand what you're saying, Miriam, and I understand what Scott is saying. I disagree about the idea of leaving money on the table. Be and I think that one of the values of having the um, the new line chart where they go up every year for us tonight is to see that any time, as, as any amount that we bump up F FY25, if we didn't change anything else about the assumptions that we've put in place, all those lines increase, except for the green one, because it's capped. And I think the real challenge for us as board members is that we have to make system-wide decisions when there are real human beings involved in the in the system but we still have to make system-wide decisions. Um, I took the opportunity to have coffee with a former board member who, um, to just see like, what would you do if you were still sitting in this seat? And she shared with me that when she joined the board, an iteration of the board before her had avoided making cuts to personnel because they cared so much about the people who were filling those roles which I completely and totally understand. But because they had avoided making those cuts, there was nearly no money for facilities. There was nearly no money for supplies. And the board that she was on had to build back up a budget that invested in the buildings that our children were going to school in and our teachers were teaching in. And so I don't think it is right of us to, um, to to avoid the very difficult decisions that have, yes, human beings behind them without considering that there are human beings in our facilities and there are human beings in transportation and there are human beings in the tax rate. And so I feel comfortable with this budget where it is, given as difficult as it is. Yeah, no, I want. I want to second that too. I I definitely respect the desire to to protect people, and I think that's that's something we need to do and need to give a lot of thought to. Um, but we're gonna have to make tough choices, and this year might be the easiest of the tough choices. In the next two or three that we have, uh, and. Um, not making tough choices now are going to make the choices tougher next year and tougher the year beyond that. Uh, and I also really feel confident that Libby and Christina and, and the leadership team have thought hard about both this year and, and the outlook years. And, you know, the, the questions I've asked about impacts to our goals, to the education of students, have all been asked, answered, at least for me, satisfactory that, that these are, you know, strategic cuts that make sense now that don't interfere with longer term goals, even if they do unfortunately have, have impacts on people. And I think Mia was, was very right that, that all our choices are going to have impacts on people, whether it's going to be, uh, you know, unfortunately people's jobs, it's going to be people's ability to afford staying in their house, uh, you know, with, with tax rates. Uh, it's going to be decisions about how our kids get to school. Um, so we have a lot of tough choices and, and I, I 
I actually feel this this current budget is is a is a very well balanced first start. Uh, and no, we don't know what the we don't have few. Yeah, we have lower confidence as it goes out, but we we do know that without I think pretty unrealistic changes, we are going to have to continue to be strategic about our our cuts and delaying choices is not going to make it easier for future boards who are going to be in this position next year. Emma? Yeah, I mean, one of the depressing things about considering the next five years is like, so this, the reduction in force represents about three FTEs. And I just don't see that's how, how that's sustainable over the next five years. Like I can't picture cutting three FTEs every year for the next five years. I just can't picture how that will work in uh, maintaining high quality education for the students. Um, and yeah, I'm just gonna reiterate my, my stance as I feel like a 0.2 FTE represents about 25, maybe to $35,000. And that just feels like such a small drop in the bucket when it would allow this one person a whole nother year, we can consider cutting it next year, but a whole nother year to do like life planning around a career change. And I think that that would be um, in line with the values of you know how we value staff and the student experience. And I haven't heard a great, for all of these other positions, I've it sort of like resonates and makes sense about like, we, you know, there's low enrollment and even the library media specialist, the principal spoke to that, that it's not really, functioning that way. And for this particular position, there hasn't been a clear explanation to me anyway, maybe in your meetings um, around like why it's going to be valuable to cut that, like how that, you know, why that's a good choice, that particular position. It just seems like if you have a person in the building for 0.2 FTEs more, that can only support students. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, you know, that it shouldn't be done. Um, but I just think postponing it another year would be, um, would give that person more time to plan that life change. So that's the last I'll talk about it. So there is a person behind the K-6 licensure cut. As of right now, it's the last person hired. Right. There is a person behind the library media person cut as well, um, who was hired quite a while ago. If you're looking at the board's focus of academic achievement for all, then you should be looking at the RVS pre-K because pre-K education is possibly the most important education years of a child's life, as research shows. Mm -hmm. So I think that the board, if if the board wants to, as a vote, wants to put some of these rifts back into place, I think you need to be honest with yourselves about why you're doing it and it needs to connect to your values and the focus of the board. Mm -hmm. um, and so there is a person behind three of those rifts that is currently in, in a staffing position at Montpelier Roxbury. Yeah. So to say just one is more important than others doesn't That's feel right I mean, to me. But, okay. And then the Roxbury pre-K position, while we have low enrollment and it's hard to hire for, um, which were the reasons why it's on this list, it's what hurts that it's on this list is because pre-K is is so um, unbelievably important in a child's life, right? So that would have to be considered as well, right? When you're getting there. So then you're down to one FTE RIP that doesn't have a person in it and probably isn't connected a whole lot to student achievement or student experience. So now we're above the 10% without you're doing if, other things. If we had, if we put all the one, right. all the positions back in that had people have right. attached them or that were attached to the board's focus and values. Right. And academic right. achievements. So then you're back up over the 10%. And so then we'd, we'd, in the matter of the next two weeks, we'd be looking at what else can we do? Or what else should we do? Should we add more of the fund balance in? Should we cut more facilities? Should, you know, that's a lot of thinking in the next two weeks before we have to warn this meeting. So I would just ask the board to really think about what you say your values are, what you say your focus is, and be thinking about that there are three positions in there that have people behind them, not one, but three.
I really appreciate you bringing up the RVS pre-K position. Um, I know that we had a small number of families. I think you said it was four. Uh, but when I do think, and I think maybe it was three of those families that actually said that the part-time day program wouldn't work. So right. are we talking about one? Possibly. Um, but I certainly think about what, you know, if, if those family circumstances change and the half-day program does become a value, um, I think what Roxbury families are facing is the plight of getting on a waiting list at a neighboring community preschool that is you know, one to two to three plus miles long. Um, and, you know, and I think I brought this up at two meetings ago too, that, you know, being in education, zero to five equates to success as an adult. It is not to be underestimated. Um, so I really appreciate you bringing up, um, you know, the potential value of plugging that position back in for, um, you know, Roxbury in particular. I, you know, last year, I think families were starting to get into scramble of where they might go and calls were being made to Northfield. Yep, you're 20th on the list and you're way down the list because you're coming from another town. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we get on, when a Roxbury family gets on a list in another town, you're behind every Everybody else who's already in that town because we're not taxpayers in that community. So um, it's a significant um, impact when, you know, we don't have a pre-K program. Again, I understand demand is essential, but I just want to echo absolutely what Libby said, that the pre-K piece um, is, it's just essential for the trajectory of kids over the long term. Yeah. Jill. Thanks. I just had two quick questions. Um, one, Libby, were you just saying that the the RIF positions, if they were um, included in the budget, it would push us over the 10%? Yeah, we okay. would be right at 10%. And I don't see the presentation anymore. Is the pre-K position in Roxbury that you guys are talking about currently a RIF or currently in the budget? I'm sorry, I just, I don't know where it's it goes. Currently, a, well, it's, it will, we're suggesting it's a RIF for next year's budget. I see. Okay. Thank you. But it's, it's not, not filled right now. now. It's not it's filled up. right now. It's in our budget for FY24. It's just not filled. We couldn't find a teacher for it. Thank you. I just want to ask Jill's question again, make sure I'm hearing it right. So if we are to reintroduce one RIF, then we exceed the 10% or all? Add it up. If yeah, you add, add them all up yeah. together, it brings us to... It yeah. exceeds the 10%. Okay, thank you. Would this would be a good time to go to the public. Yeah, meeting. I just want to. I just want to make one more question. Um, just in terms of the um, the projections chart, if we could add Roxbury in, if that formula is, I imagine, pretty straightforward. I just think. If community members, this is sort of like our standing record, and if community members go looking, um, it's there for Montpelier, but it's not for Rockbury. And I would love to be able to point to folks, you know, if they have questions about how that will impact, um, you know, and again, their guesses, their hypotheticals, um, but so that Rockbury folks could see that for themselves. I guess you could just say, assuming it does a three percent track every year. I don't know. For the, I, I think it would be similar. You talking about this one? No, I'm talking about the one with the green, yes, what Mia has. Page 35. Yeah. Right. So at the bottom it shows kind of what the CLA changes. Yeah, kind of the post-residential tax rate with the CLA introduced for Montpelier, but it doesn't show up for Roxbury. And I just think it would be it would be good for folks to be able to see that in Roxbury too. It should be very similar. What's that? It would be very similar. It would be very similar? Yeah. I mean, okay. Roxbury CLA probably move similarly, but a little bit more bouncy. Um, but it, it should be basically the same story overall. Okay. I mean, could we just write then same for Roxbury or whatever it needs to be, but just, I think it would be helpful in our community just to point people, this is, this is what's out there in the public budget forum. And how does it, how does it look for Roxbury? <laughs> um, so Scott has his hand point? up, but I don't know if you guys can see it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jill. Uh, just thank you, Jill. Um, Libby, I just have a quick question about um, about retirements. I feel like a couple of meetings ago, you had mentioned, um, yeah, there were some discussions going on about potential um, like retirement buyouts or whatnot. And I'm curious if there's if you have any information about potential retirements. And I can't remember, but I thought there was like a conversation with the teachers 
union, but nothing had been uh, agreed upon yet. And so I'm curious if there's any any information about those. The Thank retirement you. buyout offer has gone out to two of our unions, to the MREA, which are is our teachers union, our professional staff, and AFSPE, which is um, support staff, custodians, technolo technological people, and administrative assistants. And we have one AFSPE member who has taken advantage of the retirement offer, and we have had no MREA members as of yet, but I think the deadline is still... I'm looking at Joe. The deadline's like January 15th or something like that. Yeah. So if people are still considering it, they have time to consider it. Awesome. Thank you. So let's open it up to the public. Um, start with the room first. I know there's someone from Roxbury who's like they've had their hand up for a while. So I want to start with the room and then we can go online if anyone wants to open up the room. Joe? Sorry. Joe Carroll, MRE. It's a process question. I'm hoping for clarity on the January 17th meeting. Is there going to be another presentation like this and then y'all take the vote and then it heads to town meeting? Or is tonight sort of that night and the last um, opportunity for advocacy and discussion and things of that sort? And I know I'm asking a question as a statement, but yeah, I hope so, you'll grant me. It's a good question, yeah. Joe. Um, I think we'll probably do just a quick overview of the budget and especially if there's any changes, um, either changes in numbers, you know, uh, seems like our, um, what used to be utilized pupil rate keeps changing a little. Um, it's typically just the graph of the, yeah. okay. of the budget. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll have public comment. So, you know, before I take a vote, if there's, you know, last, um, you know, last opportunity to, to weigh in before we do pass it and, um, and then it will, that will move the, the town hall. So, um, yeah, so that, that will be the process. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else in the room, Nathan? Uh, Nathan Souter, Montpelier resident and parent of two kids. Thank you all very much. I'm fascinated by the this page, which is the assumption assumptions page. And it sounds, I'm trying to understand the dollar yield even further. Maybe Jake and I can have like a two-day tutorial. <laughs> um, so... I was trying to find a historic trend for what has happened with the dollar yield um, over the last, say, six years in Vermont, and I'm finding that a little inscrutable. Um, I grew well. I agree that going down a thousand dollars a year is unlikely for five years, so it'd be down to like four thousand dollars. You're hoping at that. So maybe if we were to to um, moderate that row of your assumptions, this would look a little less scary. I think because I think that statewide there would be riots. Um but the the other thing I found that I was interesting and in, we get to it is the um one of the effects of Act 127 according to the Joint Fiscal Office 2023 report on Vermont's education financing is that um Act 127 also required the JFO to examine the inclusion of a constitutionally adequate education spending amount for school districts at a level that is determined by education funding experts to be sufficient to meet student needs. Um, the JFO goes on to say things like that's above our pay grade and stuff like that. But um, it strikes me that these assumptions and the tax impact that Emma articulated as quite scary five years from now bends a lot on a political decision in the legislature and in perhaps the executive branch in terms of what the dot what they're willing to say the dollar yield is to support uh adequate education spending for school districts at a level that is determined by education funding experts to be sufficient to meet student needs. Um, so I think that the the problem or the challenge is not in this room, right? The challenge is a statewide political challenge and 
Uh, as a parent of two kids who I wish to be educated and younger kids who are neighbors who I wish to be educated, it makes me really angry that this district, the school board, and our staff are being squeezed by uh, probably a lack of political courage to sort of make a stronger commitment to education in Vermont. So um, that's my desire. I don't expect you to be able to change it, but I stand with you and I'm happy to write legislators and um, organize and activate around that. So good luck. Thank you. Yes. I would like to just say something about um, Libby had brought up the importance of preschool programs for young children in that area of development. And Kristen had also mentioned how local schools are over. I have long waiting lists for preschools. Is there any way that the preschool in Roxbury could become a tuition supported preschool from anybody in any town? And it, it already is. Is it? Okay. So, but could we, that is that yeah. something you could so, spread that word around so people might fill it up and increase income? So under Act 166, which is the pre-K legislation, uh -huh. um, school districts are required for residents' children of yep. pre-K age to pay tuition for, I think it's up to 10 hours of pre-K services, and they can take that money wherever they want. Okay. But do you think that, do you think that residents who are on, in other towns who are on long waiting lists know that? Yeah. Okay. I think so because it just seems like that's a group that's getting pushed out of the openings that exist. And it would be a full preschool classroom would do a lot more than four or five kids. Um, and as you know, I was the preschool teacher there in Roxbury, and it's very dear to my heart to see the kids have that opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Uh, online, please use the raise hand function, or you can go off camera and just um, wave physically. Obviously, we have John from Roxbury. He's been patiently yep. with his hand up. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Jim, uh, this is John Guifrey uh, from Roxbury. He used to be the school board chair there, as well as now the select board chair here in our town. Um, I just, I raised my hand when you guys were having the CLA discussion, just as a point of clarification. Um, so while towns and cities um, do their assessments six to 10 years uh, apart, the CLA is based on fails to assess home values. And when those are out of whack, um, particularly, I think the level is 82%, but someone might know that number better. When it drops be below that, that triggers an automatic reassessment of the properties. So uh, the 3% that uh, the that's proposed in the budget is um, probably a likely scenario in rising property values over that period of time in a large um property base. So anyways, uh, but that's not really why I wanted to, to talk. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. Um, my hope is that I can provide a perspective to this discussion um, that is out of the weeds. And I don't think it's appropriate for me to comment on any of the weeds of the, the budget, but rather now removed from your situation and your position um, to urge you guys to take a look at this from uh, a perspective that I do know that you have been, um, but much to the same sentiments as Mr. Souter, I think, who just spoke, um, that this is not really a discussion that is fair to you as board members. Um, nobody, I don't think I've ever come across a, a select board or a school board who's spending money willy nilly, nor do we have lots of extra cash flowing around through our coffers to do this and you guys as a board are being put in a untenable situation 
you're being asked to evaluate two untenable scenarios. One, cutting money that cannot be cut out of a budget and still function. And two, spending tax rate dollars that are insane and also are untenable for the residents, whether they have children or not in the school. So this isn't being done by our school board. This isn't being done by our community. This is being done by the constant multi-decade tinkering of the state trying to figure out their perpetual problem, which is lack of tax revenue. So that is not a problem you guys can solve without destroying the school system. Um, you know, the assumptions of saying that, uh, Jim, you were talking about, uh, you know, in year five, if we, if we try to get there slowly, it's going to be better when we get to FY30. Um, that's the assumption that this is going to stay the same. And I find it entirely impossible that the people of our state will put up with what is going on right now with regards to how this is going to affect school systems. And we're just seeing the first round of it this year and people are going to go ballistic. And that is what forces them to go back to the drawing board and do something yet again. And it will likely be bad, just like this was and all the other previous attempts at trying to fix this. But I urge you not to start cutting things out of a system that can't be cut out of it. Because take a think about what would happen if 15 or 20 people and families left the district. We don't have large numbers. It will make things worse. And what do people do when they're committed to having good educations for their children and the school system is underfunded, underperforming, uh, doesn't have money for facilities, teachers are being riffed three a year? It's an untenable situation. So I would urge you to keep moving forward with, you know, consistent and prudent budgetary decisions with regards to your staff and maintaining the programs because we don't have any slop sloshing around in there. And we need to keep our schools functioning the way they are because without that, it is the first way to sewer your community and have people start moving out of your community to go elsewhere, either to a different town or city in our state where the schools aren't impacted as much or to move completely out of the state entirely, which hurts us doubly. So in standing up to the position that you guys are being put in, it sends a message to the legislature that this is not okay and it needs to change. And everyone who's listening here and can talk to their friends, they have to be the ones that go talk to the legislators as well and say, you guys goofed, you need to fix this and you need to change it fast because we're being put in a position to hurt our school system because you guys wanted us to mess around with proportions and percentages and it's not okay. So I'm sorry you guys are really having to deal with this. It's not fair to you. And I thank you for all your efforts and what you're trying to do. But I do urge you to try to maintain what we have right now until the citizenry of our cities, our towns and our state can tell them back to the drawing board guys, this isn't gonna work. Thanks. Hey, John. Anyone else on the line? Going once. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I just want to kind of return it to further more discussion on this. Um, I do want to echo some of the comments that came, I think, from you know Emma, John, and Nathan, certainly about the need for a state fix. And I know it might be slightly appropriate for a board chair to call for it, but I think it's really time for our legislators to re-examine this act. And I think even if they do, it will mean some, you know, it will mean that, you know, just given, I think, what's a needed uh, change in how we account for our pupils, it will, I think, will mean a higher tax burden for this community. But uh, I think the way the law is currently structured is is not manageable. Uh, but I think the administration, the board have done a really good job thus far in putting together a responsible first year budget that um, shows we are willing to, I think, 
play a part in a redistribution of, of state funds to ensure that students meet their needs. But uh, the uh, the wacky impacts of this law are are not sustainable. And I think for, for this board, the course is to, uh, at least in my opinion, to um, deal with the situation we have, uh, try to, to make the cuts as, as um, unharmful as they can be to our education mission, uh, which I think this budget at least achieves in year one, whether we'd be able to achieve that in year four or five or 2030 without a change, I think is a very different question. But um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree that, uh, you know, this community is is willing to, I think, bear a little more to ensure that that um, districts that have historically probably been underfunded are uh, better funded by the state. But uh, I plead to the legislature to do a lot of work this session to find a better way to to achieve that goal. Um, so I'll open it. I'll stop there and and reopen it up to to folks. Rick? I think that, um, you know, it's certainly hard stuff um, this year, but um, I'm proud that um, that we are willing to not maximize short term at the expense of long term. Um, a lot of elected officials, I think, um, you know, are just keep on maximizing short term at the expense of long term. And mm -hmm. it's irresponsible. It's harder to do it this way, but you know, I think it's the right thing to do. So I'm I'm glad that we're doing it. Typically we have um an invitation out to our legislators to come to us while they're in session. Do we have that on the agenda planning document or do we have a date for that? We have not set a date for that. Um Olivia Mia and I have met with, I think, pretty much all of the almost 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 all of the okay. yeah. There was a, a couple who at least one who couldn't make it. Um, I think we delivered a, a powerful message, and I, I think it was well received. Uh, um, you know, that said, I, I think you know, hearing from as many people as possible is is important. I think you know. I think words is starting to get out there. I think it was a little slow at first, um, but uh, we will we will invite the legislators to come. We haven't gotten to it yet. We've just been trying to get through this process, but um, hopefully for you know sometime in February we can, we can reach out and, and get them on the agenda. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously the the legislature session was fast, so we'll I'll try to get that out this week. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Could you just touch on that? Um, it's come up in a couple of meetings. Um, the the effect that a depleted ed fund has on something. The value. Yeah. How does that? Can you get, sort of say something to it, just so that I can try to <laughs> help it stick to my brain, maybe better. Um, so, and Nathan was curious about this too. Um, the yield is kind of the magical number that makes the ed fund work. Um, you and it, it's it came out of Act Forty Six, but really it it comes out of Act Sixty. It's like you have all these districts with tax rates based on per pupil spending, and you also know their grand list, and you sometimes you somehow magically have to plug in a number that's the denominator to make the Ed Fund fill up appropriately. That's the yield. Um, so when when times are tough in the Ed Fund, it puts pressure on tax rates and so the yield goes down and since it's the dominant denominator if that denominator is going down that drives tax rates up um when times are good the yield goes up and times going up times being good includes um property appreciating um so in the past couple of years you may have noticed the yield go up by a thousand or even two thousand yeah, it's gone up for the last for as long as I've been superintendent. Right, and that's because of of real estate appreciating pretty rapidly. So I think those things are going to kind kind of counteract each other. There's going to be a lot of pressure in the Ed Fund, but real estate is probably going to continue to appreciate. So the yield 
who knows, um, it might go down a little bit like we were looking at here. It might be level, um, but that that's the yield. Did that help? Sort of, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, I've heard it. It's just, you know, sort of thinking about the end fund being depleted over the next five years as the state covers this above uh, everything above that 5% cap. And that's not a usual pressure, I would imagine, on the end fund. So it changes the dynamics of the whole equation. That is why I'm so cognizant of saying the assumption slides are guesses because we're in a different world. I know Emma wrote an email and said, well, what's the average thing that the yield does? And like, it's not there. And you know, I can tell you that it, on average, it goes up a few hundred dollars to make on a really good year, a thousand dollars. I think that happened like two years ago or something. And we were like throwing parties the day we got that yield letter. Um, but that, that historical average of what the yield has done is not, is not something we can look at right now because we're in such new territory by just what you just said, Brad, that, that the Ed Fund has a pressure on it that it previously hasn't had. Yeah, and, and I kind of want to go to, I think something John was touching on. I mean, just there's there's a real cyclical relationship between how good our schools are and our property values. I mean, you know, if this is not a town that families want to move to, because they don't believe in our schools, you know, we're not going to get those buyers coming in and we're not going to get their their dollars. And also, you know, the the more people who come into our community, it it, it increases our student yield. It's also, you know, most families who have kids are the families that are that do not benefit from things like uh income adjusted property taxes. And income adjusted property taxes is is great in that it, it helps a lot of people you know stay in their homes past retirement but it also means that there's a lot of revenue that's being lost when you're not when you have an aging population and, and you don't have you know younger families moving in who are are paying the full amount of the revenue uh which drives that those numbers you know further down so um yeah i i just want to put a plug that you know investing in our schools it, it's not a drain. It, it is the engine oftentimes of how our communities function, uh, not just in terms of educating our kids, but economically as well. And just keeping keeping towns vibrant, keeping revenue coming in, uh, you know, keeping the, the type of things that we, we know and love about both Montpelier and Roxbury. Miriam? Yeah, I thought a minute to think about this now and um... I still feel that it's my responsibility to the students that I'm here to represent to point out that the cut that I was discussing earlier is not the most strategic way to get to our budget requirements. However, the more I think about this and the more we discuss it, it's just such an impossible situation. And the more I think about it, the less I understand how we can make this work. And I have so much appreciation for the people who are running those numbers and trying to figure out how we can make this work. Um, and so I respect the decision uh, that we're coming to on the topic. And I, yeah, I really hope we can make this work. Do, Libby, do you feel like you have enough guidance from what you've heard around using more or less fund balance and the um, reduction in force stuff? I think the um, the fund balance is a question I still have. I heard I heard a couple different things. Yeah. Um, for moving closer to if we're at eight and a half, what what portion of the fund balance can we move back? To get to nine and a half, if that's a if that's a comfortable enough place, given the unknowns, if a, if a half a percentage of point is that not enough, even if it's, you know, what's a half a percentage of the fund balance going back? I think if we move that one hundred sixty five thousand, we'd be around nine something nine five. 
if I may say, um, the training that Libby and I went to a couple weeks ago with the superintendent of business managers, we talked about like everybody gets close to 10%, but it might have um, a negative impact on the field. So it might be kicking the can down the road a little bit. Um, reports. There's a part of me that feels like in this scenario, kicking the can down the road is not a bad plan because this seems like a really untenable can and that it probably it will be a nuclear can. It anyway. feels like it's likely to change. It, it just doesn't seem like people are going to be able to shoulder that burden in 2030 if it keeps going down this road. So that's that's sort of where I stand. I think getting closer to 9.5 by um pulling back on the fund balance and by adding that point two back in, that would be my hope. Which point two? Um, the sustainability position. Or if you discuss with your team and decide that it's the Roxbury pre-K, you know, or any, you know, if you decide I mean, 0.5 is bigger than 0.2, so that's like a bigger difference. 0.1.0 is bigger than 0.2, so that's a bigger difference. But I would trust you and your team to like make the decision. But I think um, lessening the burden on RIFs as much as possible to get to 9.5. I mean, I'm hearing mixed things about what you what you want to see. Um, can I just do a quick, how many people are comfortable with the budget the way it is and want to see it presented as is next meeting? Wait, can we vote for more things than one or just one thing? How are you holding the straw poll here? <laughs> um, well, let's just talk a little, like, I guess we have, we have, we have three options. We have budget as is. Yep. I, I, I actually made four options budget with some of the riffs put back in to get closer to 9.5 budget with more reserve fund put back in to get closer to like you know low nine 9.5 nine, yeah. or budget with a combination of both of those things put in to get back to to get closer to 9.5 or 9.25 um so you could be comfortable with more than one. You could be, I'd, I'd be okay as is, or with some reserve fund put back in. Can we do right choice one? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Can I? Uh, I'm not. I think, I think those are our four choices Liz, for uh, next time. Jill's got Jill. it. I'm really sorry. I feel brain dead. So if we put more fund balance, it gets us closer to the 10, wouldn't it? No, 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 no. The okay. other way. The other way. So, oh, so you pull fund balance back out for a rainy day is what I mean. Put it back okay. in the savings account. Put it back in the savings account to use later to get closer okay. to this year. So that way we have more in future exactly. years. So adjusting the current plan that's currently on the table by reducing the fund balance that's put into that one this year so yeah. that we have that money in future years. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. I'm. Yeah. And I think that would mean. That's a good clarification, Jill. Thank yes. you. Yes. And that means getting closer to the 10%. It means, it means, yeah, it means getting closer to the 10%. But I think as Scott pointed out last time, that's that's kind of like one-time money. Do we want to use it with a, do we want to have like more money for a bigger bang, one-time bang mm -hmm. later? Or do we want to kind of like gradually do it to make the glide path a little smoother? Libby, you had um, said at a previous meeting that you wanted to keep enough of a distance from 10 to make sure we didn't go over. So, and I think it was more than 0.5. So I'm just wondering what you're comfortable with around that. Good question, Lynn. It is a good question and it's an unknown because what, like what Christina just said is advice that we have been given that the more districts who are close to 10%, more districts like us who are close to that 10% number, we'll pull more from the ed fund, which sounded at that time to be unexpected that districts would be close to the 10% by government officials. Um, and so if that's the case, there they told us there was a possibility that in May, 
the, the dollar yield would be different than what we are now. I don't remember that ever happening before other than in a positive direction. Well, we haven't had like a year like this before. Yeah, but the, we're in new territory yeah. again. So I don't know if that's accurate. I don't know if that's a scare tactic. I don't know <laughs> what that was, but Christine, Christine and I did hear that same advice. Um, also increases what the Fed funds would have to pick up because we're at the cap. So you have to think kind of statewide too what that looks like for the Fed funds. Yeah. So we'd want to give ourselves room. I don't Does the dollar yield impact that? I'm drawing a mind blank right now. It gets set in the next. I know, but will it impact our per pupil? Equalized amount. I forget my my. No, it comes in after. It comes in after it. It's locked. Yeah, it comes in after it. Is the effect of Act One Twenty Seven sort of balanced out mm -hmm. overall? As in, like, there's sort of an equal number of districts that are disadvantaged, or sort of equivalent amount of districts that are disadvantaged oh. as opposed to those that are advantaged, or is it skewed in in either direction? What was the first part? The, the idea that we're we're essentially, this district is essentially disadvantaged by this new formula. There are a handful of other districts, at least that I've heard of in the state that are also disadvantaged. Is it relatively even, the number of districts that are disadvantaged as we are, as a pair, compared to the, the districts that... They told us that, right? And I'm scratching my brain to feel like they told us. Because if it's a small... Yeah, it was so in the original modeling by the Joint Fiscal Office, it was 50 50 ish. Um, but um, the, this year, at least so far, um, it's kind of like leaning more towards more districts being disadvantaged and being capped at the 5%, at least now. That might change as, as time goes on. But generally, like what's going on statewide is like, what I would call Vermont suburban, and this is my own term for it, but like Montpelier, um, Champlain Valley, Essex, Norwich, se pretty severely disadvantaged by design. Um, and then the more urban districts that have a lot of English language, multilingual, multilingual learners, sorry, multilingual learners um, and students in poverty are greatly advantaged and also rural districts, they have a new weight for rural areas and small schools within rural areas. So Which, those are the, the, the more advantaged districts. Yeah. So, that's, so that's, like that's, we're losing capacity, really but there are lots of districts which are gaining a lot of tax capacity right now around the state. So, you know, it's all by design. But, you know, I, was making dinner last night and a soup was in one of the other disadvantaged districts in Jake's suburban Vermont. <laughs> um, and she was like, this is whack. I don't know how we're going to get through this budget season. This is the wackiest thing I've ever, like their, her board is feeling very similar to, yeah. to you all. Um, and I think. So this is I, a super in a, in a small rural. No, you know, in a, in a suburban uh -huh. district in the yeah. Champlain Valley. Yeah. And, and she was like, and and she's feeling very similar to how I'm feeling about it too. So like, mm -hmm. you're not alone. I know that doesn't make you feel any better, no. but well, and the reason why I ask is because if there's a if there's a if there's a critical mass of people that are moving right. towards that ten percent that are getting close to it, then that's makes me less does less wanting to go towards it. Essentially, if right. it's a so smaller group. It. If it's a smaller group that's sort of disadvantaged, then I'm less concerned that we're close to the 10% in a sense, which is all very theoretical, but it is very theoretical. My, my However, the, the people who are going, who are most likely to be near that 10% are also the districts that have a very large student population relative to ours and a much higher budget. And so when they're going closer to 10%, they're capped at five. And they're their they're going to be their budgets double ours, triple ours. So it's it's a uh, those are the districts that Jake is kind of talking about. You know, Essex Essex Westburn's budget is triple ours. Champlain Valley is probably probably quadruple ours. Um, and that those are the districts that are so to fill in the blank there, or to complete your sentence, I think to backfill from the Ed Fund 
to their budget is a lot more money than to backfill budget. Yeah. our budget. Right. And um, can somebody remind me through our budget discussion for fund balance, didn't, didn't we, um, like initially we were assuming we wouldn't use any of it and then we wanted to. We had always known that we were going to use 400,000 that that's been in play and in, in, uh, long-term yeah that that's been just a plan that we typically use four hundred thousand dollars of our fund balance over the last i don't know at uh, five years we've done that almost every year i've been here um and so this year it's like it's up to 568 or something like that but if i recall correctly fy25 was the last year of that yes. plan so yes. so if for fy26 and fy27 we would be like like right now for FY25, our plan is to use five to use five hundred sixty five thousand. But if we put that one sixty five back into the fund balance and didn't use it, then there's one hundred sixty five thousand more for twenty six, twenty seven, twenty eight. And to me, it it seems kind of significant that we didn't yet we don't it wasn't part of our long term plan yet for FY twenty six on to use fund balance because it feels like it it makes it even more valuable that it's there to be able to use it given the charts that we've been looking at. I think the other piece of, um, you know, if we put pressure on the fund balance, it, the, we as a big group, um, it maybe puts pressure on the legislators to- You mean on the education I mean, fund? Yeah, sorry, the, I, yeah, I misspoke. The education fund um it puts more pressure on the legislators to really rethink what's happening here i mean they're going to have to deal with it, it it clearly paints the picture of the impact of the legislation that they've enacted so in some ways it's like <laughs> here you go um uh, back to the so. poll i i my vote is to do is to give Libby as much flexibility as possible and not to put like a number 9.5 percent but closer to increase and uh, my vote would be a mix of both fund balance and um, reduction in force to get closer to 9.5. Okay. Um, against the 0.5 pre-K position altogether. So if you wanted to, I would go for a 1.0 there. Uh, otherwise, nobody's going to go. And that's a horrible program that is a shame. And I don't know if a 1.0 would actually bring in revenue. Who knows? There's a lot of need for childcare and and in a working class community like mine, uh, and the surrounding communities. Um, and those are, you know, those are the values of the surrounding communities that, uh, you know, pre-K, after school programming, like helping people work so that they can put money on the table. That's that's what people need in 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 my neck of the woods. Which of the which of the options are you voting? Uh, well, no, no, not oh, yeah, one point oh free k. No, 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 it's not that. Um, I, I, I'm just for moving towards nine point five. I, I don't, I don't know what to say about how it's done. Okay. I, what? Um, I'm for moving toward and wherever that ends up with Libby's thoughts about a safe margin there and um and taking money from the uh fund balance so just so i'm clear i've got to it I, moving moving towards 9.5 mix of we have uh, i'm just counting votes right now we've Kristen. got one yeah go ahead Chris. second okay. second lens and so moving toward 9.5 and putting more money back into the fund balance together. Do we want to do Jill and Scott? Uh, Scott and Jill, or Jill and Scott, however you want to go. Sorry, I know I live in the world of math, but I'm really struggling. So when people are saying move fund balance to get closer to 9.5, they're if saying you, don't buy point. down our budget with our fund exactly. balance. Yes. They're saying leave more money in the fund balance, which will yes. then okay. I'm for that. That's fine. I'm 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 pretty go with the flow, but that that makes sense to me if that's the will of the board. 
Um, oh. Scott went away. He disappeared. Oh, I bet he tried to unmute himself. Yep, I'll probably tried to unmute himself. Okay. We'll I'll come back. back. We'll come back to Scott. Um, Jake. Uh, fun balance. Mia. Yeah. Uh, fun balance. Scott, you're back. Or stay as is. Uh, that's why I wanted ranked choice voting, yeah. but I knew that would get too yeah. complicated at 8.15 at night. Yeah. Scott. Can, can you hear me? Can I hear you? I can't hear you, but you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear two of you now. <laughs> at least see two of you. I love it. Two votes. Doing, I'm with you, Mia. I would, if I was ranked choice, I'm, I'm leave it as is or fun balance. If that's helpful. All right. Yep. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I think it goes without saying that I, um, yeah, I think it's irresponsible for us to do anything other than get up to 9.5 or higher. And how how would you like to do that? Um, leave it up to Libby. Fun balance. I yeah. I think I trust Libby. All right. And I I think I'm in the Mia Jill camp of either as is or fun balance, and which I think I I think the winner seems to be fun balance. Yeah, and and I'm. I'm also hearing most board members say, "Let it let let's try to get closer to nine point five. Yeah, using fund balance, like using yeah, right, using every time or, of, of, or using the fund balance, right, to to get there. Okay, yeah. we can show you that. Yeah. Um. Till next week. Thanks, or, Christina. Yeah, thanks, Christina. He's like, I'm gonna go crush some more numbers for y'all. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Um, so we will come. We will see that budget next uh, week, and we will. Uh, two weeks. Two weeks. Don't yes. don't forget. We haven't. Don't do that to me. We're not doing yes. the every week anymore. Don't do that. And um, I know you guys don't have votes, but let's hear from the students as well. Oh, anyone? It's a straw poll. Yeah. Straw poll. Um, the debate to exclude you, but I have just been listening, and at first I had some, I think, opposing opinions. But what Mia said kind of put it into perspective about, you know, thinking about the future and every single student that's under these facilities, and that's kind of made me not completely reevaluate what I think, but it's kind of, I guess, made me think more adult, I think. Um, so I'm just trying to deal with that reevaluation in my head tonight. Yeah. That's real. And well, to be clear, to reevaluate your thinking is a very impressive thing to do that many adults create. Pretty mature. <laughs> Laura and I have the same opinion on this. Mm -hmm. I'm Deeply uncomfortable with all of it because I know that I and my friends will have to live with all the consequences of this, and I know that we as a board will have to live with that as well. But um, that means making tough choices as well, I suppose. Jill's better handle. Jill. Um, just real quick, I don't want to throw a wrench in the works, but I remember at one point because we had a healthy fund balance, we were worried that would get clawed back. I'm feeling like we made it through that gauntlet okay in the last few years. So there's not, there isn't a risk that if we're really good about keeping our fund balance for the next five years, that that could be somehow clawed back to the ed fund or used against us in any way, right? I mean, I feel like that's part of why we wanted to sort of encumber it is because we didn't want it to get taken away. Sorry. And I can only see Libby's reaction. So I want to... <laughs> That's, My reaction I just, was the same as Jake's almost at the exact same time. <laughs> just a, another unknown, but hopefully not. It's, yeah, it gets threatened occasionally, mostly by the governor, I would say. Um, but I haven't heard anything about that lately. Um, 
I will tell you in all honesty, that would take the agency of education having a pretty well-versed idea of what our fund balance is. And I can't see that happening anytime in the near future. Um, and so I personally am not very worried about that. Um, I think that a response from legislators who are more worldly um, to critiques of this law could be twofold. One could be our class sizes in Vermont are very small. Let's make them bigger. And I didn't say that's a Libby, that's a Libby thing. I'd say that that could be a response to critiques of 127. Um, and another thing people could say is you have a flush fund balance, use it. And so it would just be more of a suggestion, a strong suggestion to yeah. use it. I could see that happening, which sounds like it's part of the strategy. It has to be part of our strategy going forward anyway. So, um, so yeah, that's what I would say. Okay, thanks. Well, they can't, they can't torture us. You know, if they're gonna create a cliff after five years, they can't also take our fund. Right. That's <laughs> cruel and unusual. Thing. I was like, that would be just- Yeah, it would be mean. Putting salt in the wound a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking the exact same thing. Okay, we'll put, no. get closer to 9.5%. Okay. Um, so we'll see that next week. Thank everyone for the hard work and great thought on this. Uh, we're not done yet, but I think we're closer. Um, final order of business before we adjourn, policy monitoring report. We have B8, electronic communication between employees and students. Do I have a motion to approve the B8 monitoring report? So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Boy, I've got a lot. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.